thank you so much for joining us tonight for our first edition of Epicenter Insights. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, Epicenter is a podcast focused on blockchain and decentralization technologies. And uh, this podcast has been around for about four years. It's exploring like highly technical aspects of blockchain projects and diving deep into white papers, at least. <laughs> Uh, however, we thought that you know it's good from time to from time to time to take a step back and take a look at the big picture of the space and think about like where are we at uh, in terms of like our efforts of redecentralizing the web, uh, and that's why we organize this event. And today we'll focus on the concept of decentralization, which is one of the most frequently used concepts in the space. And I think everyone is kind of get, kind of like getting a little bit lost. Uh, when we think about like what aspects and levels of decentralization do we actually uh, care about while building blockchain projects and decentralized technology. And that's, that's what we'll explore tonight. Uh, so we have a panel debate. Um, here are our guests. This is Florian, the blockchain lawyer, blockchain.lawyer. <laughs> uh, this is Lise uh, from Least Authority, uh, Ella, the founder of Oscoin, uh, Ravi uh, from Early Bird Venture Capital, and Brian the founder of Epicenter. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we also have, um, yeah, I would like to thank you as well for, to our sponsors, Shapeshift, uh, Early Bird, uh, and for, to the family for hosting us tonight. Yeah, so we wanted to, you know, take this evening and this discussion to sort of take a step back a little bit and not necessarily talk about which coin is going to go highest in the next month. But, uh, but more think about what, what are some of the longer term implications of all of this technology and, uh, and how do we think about that as, as people working in this. But maybe before we get started, we can just do a brief round of introduction and everybody can speak like I know, two minutes about what they do and kind of what they find most interesting in the space. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm Florian. Uh, Blockchain.lawyer is indeed my domain, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> I don't know how many top-level domains there are, but it's a small club of people that have a blockchain.something domain, I suppose. <laughs> so yeah, I bought that one in 2015, and it has been kind of a crazy ride since then, because uh, I kind of then um, got really uh, early into this blockchain versus law problem, which has many different facets. and. Um, most recently, I've been uh, concerned with basically helping actually the German government to understand what blockchain is, because they ended up giving themselves the political mandate to develop a regulatory framework here in Germany. If you download the coalition agreement between CDU, CSU, and SPD, you will find the word blockchain mentioned seven times in that document. And what that really translates into is all the ministries in Germany doing like workshops on blockchain and like developing, like writing kind of white papers for them internally. And um, they kind of run them by this new association that I co-founded, which is called the Blockchain Bundesverband. And we basically advise them from a kind of technical perspective on what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. So it's quite interesting and that's more or less what I do. I'm Liz Steininger from Least Authority. We do security audits and we also do software development in the open source space, mostly focused on privacy and security aspects. We believe that privacy is a right for everybody to have, and so we pursue things to that goal. But um, yeah, that's Least Authority. Hello, my name is Eleftherios and I'm the co-founder of OSCoin. OSCoin is a project out of Berlin, uh, and what we're attempting to do with it is we're building a community-owned and operated network for open source collaboration and incentivization. So we're basically going after the problem of sustainability of open source, specifically targeting maintainers. Uh, I've been in Berlin for some time, I uh, was at SoundCloud, was an early employee there. Uh, I've been living here and loving Berlin for the last seven years. Hi everyone, my name is Ravi. I'm uh, with Early Bird Venture Capital, a VC fund. Um, basically, I should say at this point, traditional VC fund um, based out of Berlin and Munich uh, and Istanbul. So we do uh, seed and Series A investments um, across Europe or have been doing this for the past around 20 years. 
Um, we as a fund have been in, interested in crypto for a while. Um, so our first investment in the space was a big chain DB in 2014 where we led the seed round. Um, then of course we're proud investors in Shapeshift um, where we uh, did the Series A um, about a year ago. And um, yeah, we, we are actively looking for um, or looking to invest in the space because we are uh, generally um, yeah, highly convinced that um, you know, uh, decentralization and Web 3.0 are um, is a technology and a movement that um, that is going to be sustainable in the future and is going to be a play a big role in the future. Um, that said, of course, we are currently balancing um, kind of the crypto and decentralized world with the more traditional VC world in several ways. So as you can uh, imagine, um, ICOs and, and token sales are, are affecting us in several ways. There are, of course, a competition to our um, to the more traditional VC model in some way. Um, and of course, also, we are investing also in other businesses that are, I want to say, disrupting industries in more traditional ways. Like, for example, we are an, an investor in N26, which many of you may know, the digital bank, which is disrupting the banking industry, but uh, in an, a different way, of course, um, than the more com kind of complete uh, decentralized way. Um, so this is kind of some of the things that we are balancing right now. Um, me personally, I got involved in, in crypto in 2013. Um, then um, it kind of, uh, yeah, didn't, you know, that was mostly privately. And then um, kind of got into it also from a professional side when I joined Early Bird about two years ago. Um, and, and I'm leading the, the efforts in our, uh, in our firm in this regard. Cool, fantastic. So I thought maybe we can start here. So you mentioned decentralized technologies, right? So that brings all this word decentralized. Now, I'm especially curious with you, LA, like what does decentralized mean? You know, like why is it important? And if, if you look at OS coin, how will you know whether you succeeded in building something decentralized? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think like starting from this whole centralization versus decentralization. I just want to start with something very fundamental. I think like for the last 20 years of technology, even like earlier than that, I think we experienced this, you know, very centralized force on the internet uh, where basically everything in a way was centralized. I think what we're experiencing right now, there's this resurgence around decentralization. That doesn't mean that decentralization is a, a, a panacea that, you know, fits everything. Uh, so, but I think that right now we actually like, you know, going from the one extreme to the other extreme where you see loads of team, teams out there, you know, basically like, you know, pitching the world centralization without even meaning what that could mean. Uh, I think eventually, you know, we're gonna end up being a bit more balanced. Things that actually make sense to be centralized will be centralized. Things that don't make sense to be centralized, uh, they will be decentralized. Now, specifically to what I'm excited, I think at the core of it, there is the, what I call the internet infrastructure. Uh, I think, you know, at, at when, 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 when we, like when we, uh, I think myself in there, although I wasn't there, when we created the internet uh, as a society, I think the, the fundamental idea behind this was this exchange of information without any intermediary and no one getting in between that. And I think actually while we started in a, in, in a great way, eventually what happened was I think we've seen this, like, I, I, like we've seen basically a few companies on the internet owning, uh, owning the space and owning us, owning our personal data, owning our interactions, and this paradigm where basically two of us can can transact without any intermediary actually like didn't like didn't end up happening. It actually ended up failing in a way. So the first thing that I'm actually very very excited about is decentralized internet infrastructure going back to this idea that indeed you know we can be transacting safely like you know and we can be you know respecting our individual like you know our, 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 our individual nature in a way uh, without actually anyone interfering uh, between that okay so we're going back to fundamentals like privacy on top of that you have other things like uh, what we call you know um, distributed technologies in a way where indeed you have a lot of benefits in having more of a decentralized infrastructure uh, classic example that I think a lot of people used and I also myself used a lot of times to pitch the space to friends that were actually more skeptical is take storage for example right like you know we all having all of these resources in, in in our hands we're using you know like we have all of these computational resources and all of the storage resources that actually we're not utilizing uh, 
So what actually, if we if we if we were able to do something much more interesting that that is much more fault tolerant, as we say in, in computer science. So there's this aspect of that, and storage is just one component. And the third thing that I'm personally much more excited about is uh, what I call decentralized ownership. In a way, I think a lot of people are talking about decentralization, but they forgot that they forgot to decentralize ownership. Indeed, where we're going is in, we're going towards community-owned networks on the internet. I hope that that's you know where we're moving towards. Either that's for storage, for computation, for open source collaboration, for transcoding, live peer. You know, I hope that we're going towards that. And what's exciting to me about that world is you know this distinction between capital and work is actually blaring a lot, right? Like take Bitcoin, for example, you contribute to the protocol, and I know that actually right now it's actually quite hard and it's being centralized again, but the, ho the whole idea of contributing to a network and being incentivized natively from that network for your work and getting to see ownership within, within that network, this is, this is fascinating to me. I really hope that, for example, I spend years on the music industry. I hope that you know, we eventually end up to create you know, a community on Spotify or a community on SoundCloud where the, the value creators will get to see some of the benefits of ownership that until now only the capital was seeing. So yeah, I think these, these, three, these, these three areas are the ones that immediately come to, to my head. So, so, so you said this kind of ability to transact with each other without intermediaries. Then for information and for money, right? Like that's the big play of blocks and of course, you know, like not just about information but for money. That was one. Uh, the second one, uh, decentralized infrastructure for the internet, call it computation, call it storage. And the third one is much more community community owned and operated networks of all sorts of kind. So what about you, Florian? And do you think like a, a legal perspective brings something to that that people generally miss? Um, in a sense, yeah, because the the invention of blockchain in a sense was culturally possibly a reboot for how we want to design legal systems right because uh, from uh, historically we've built legal systems based upon this idea of a monarch or some dictator or some centralized force of power that exerts that and can create rules that become binding by somebody having the monopoly of force and suddenly the blockchain pivoted a system that does not at all depend on force, but merely economic incentives. And it, it is a new governance tool for big amounts of people, maybe even bigger than nation states have ever managed to scale up to. And um, I think um, what people in the blockchain space who realize this, the potential, uh, and are very excited about this, what they miss is that by rebooting this, we also get rid of a lot of interesting and useful things that have been actually invented in the legal systems that we had traditionally. And really it's about um, trying not to reinvent the wheel where we don't have to, I think. And um, so the famous DAO Ethereum hard fork discussion, right? Uh, um, it's the prime example that showed even in a decentralized system like the blockchain if something goes wrong and With technology we all know there is always something that can go wrong suddenly you fall back into this basic primal Human mode where you like, you know No, it was you know, it's my money I if, for those and those reasons and you write angry reddit posts, right for those reasons It's my money and I want that that to happen and somebody somebody else has an opposing view and ultimately what you need is some kind of rule book by which an, uh, uh, an uh, Independent arbitrator would kind of you know say well It's like this or like that and everybody now sticks to that result, right? So this is kind of the reinvention of a legal system in disguise and it would probably um, expediate the process if people in the blockchain space were more aware of certain solutions that have been designed in law beforehand. And on the other hand, positively, I do think there are actually startups working around that uh, in, in that space. LAUGHTER <laughs> So, so what about you, Liz? So right, least authority has been around for, for a long time and building sort of privacy-centric technology. And now with, with blockchain, right, we're adding uh, monetization, which is changing so much. 
So do you think that there's things that are like, you know, we're sort of forgetting that we're actually important insights because all of a sudden now there's money in it? Um, yeah, yeah, money makes us forget things, right? <laughs> money makes money can distract us. Money isn't the solution to all of our problems either. But um, coming back to the beginning of your question about um, about the money being out of the problems that we're solving, uh, one thing that we work a lot with is uh, distributed decentralized data storage and how we can have um, privacy, how, how that can enhance people's um, ability to have privacy around their data and control over their own data. And looking back at the, the history of that space has really helped me it, as an individual to understand that, yeah, we are part of a bigger context, that this is a wave of technology that's happening, but it is happening on the shoulders of giants of the past. And like Florian was saying about when it comes to the legal space, it's really important to look at, um, yeah, we want to disrupt the system, we want to change it, but are there aspects of the previous system that maybe weren't so bad? that we should keep? What should we keep that's good? What do we want to change that's bad? And when it comes to like the distributed uh, data storage space, it, it has helped me to look back and to talk to other people who have tried to solve the problem before and to see, and to see how looking back like even 20 years that this, this is not a new problem, that people have been trying to solve it, that money, even the idea of digital, digital money is something that people were trying to solve well before Bitcoin came around. And it's just, it's really helpful to look back at those problems and see how they solved it. And I think that money can help in terms of incentives, of how you want to incentivize particular behavior and governance, like you were talking about of projects, is really important to then also reinforce particular behavior in systems. And that as we move forward in the blockchain space, it's really important for us to all consider, um, yeah, these different levers for creating the behavior and the outcome that we want. So if we have a goal for a particular type of world or a problem to be solved, to think that we have these governance levers, these legal levers, we have these financial levers, and how can we put all these pieces together to create a better world or a better solution? Cool, so do you think there's something inevitable about blockchain and decentralized technology to lead to this and to lead to kind of you know more um, maybe privacy preserving and free world, or do you think this is, you know, key design decisions have to be made so that we end up there and we don't end up in like a very different outcome? So do I think it's inevitable or do we have control? Is yeah, I mean, is, is it inevitable? <laughs> is, is this sort of where, you know, the market and equipment is just like driving us there? Or is this, you know, does it depend on the design decisions that people make? Uh, both. I think that um, one big thing that's interesting, there's, there's been a lot of money and smart people that are now focusing their efforts in the decentralized space. And so that inevitably will have some sort of important out outcome in our world, that there will be some sort of impact from that. If you put lots of, lots of dedicated smart people and lots of money to drive them, then you're gonna get something. And then as far as, like, as far as our control over that outcome, yeah, we need to think about what we're doing. We need to think about like, what we're trying to achieve by the decisions that we make. And technology is not neutral. Technology does push towards a particular outcome. You can incentivize people with your, your um, mechanism design and your tokens, and you can, you can influence people with how you arbitrate the problems that come in your community. Um, you're gonna influence the outcome there. And so, yeah, every, everything that we do, it, it matters, and it's going to be amplified by all this attention on the space. So, so Ravi, right, you guys have invested in, or, or Early Bird, I guess, maybe before you, has invested in all kinds of businesses, and, and I guess the idea of disruption was always, you know, was always there, right? You try to invest in sort of the next new thing. Now, with blockchain, many people have this expectation that it's, you know, not just sort of a more efficient way of, I don't know, delivering groceries or selling books or something, but that they will, you know, rewire society. So do you think that as investors, there's sort of a different role and maybe different responsibility, or is it just about, you know, what what is a more efficient system? It's a, that's a good question. Um, so I think, um, I'm not sure if we have a different role. I mean, um, 
I guess what, what hasn't changed is that, of course, we are invest, we invest other people's money to make a, a gain, in, essentially, right? So that hasn't changed. But I think what really excites me about the space is that, first of all, I absolutely think that the degree of innovation and the degree of change that this technology can bring is much, much bigger than um, than anything else we've invested in. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, it, compared to you know the 10,000th uh, e-commerce company, which is uh, very little exciting, um, this technology can can bring you know, as you say, right, Ch change not only to um, tech and to to business model, but also to um, to um, a democracy or to political systems um, and all those kinds of things. So, and I think in that sense, our role might be different because the companies that we invest in have the, have, a, have a much bigger potential to shape our future. Um, and I mean, this is something that in, excites me about being a VC in general, that I get to uh, invest hopefully in companies that, um, you know, will have a positive impact on the future. And I think um, in, um, in the decentralized world, this is possible to a larger extent um, and also possibly to an extent that is not um, necessarily so profit driven because I mean, um, before all, every company that we've invested in is centralized and essentially is locking in the profits or if it's a successful business then it will lock in the profits and the profits will only go to very, very few people, right? And obviously including us. Um, but then um, if, you, if we invest in decentralized companies, um, the much bigger um, group of people can benefit from this and um, I think decentralized projects have a much bigger potential to um, to make things better without um, and spreading basically the the gains from it on a much larger um, onto a much larger group of people which I think is exciting because and again I mean this is kind of a I guess a conflict here a little bit since we are like I said we are investors and our business is to make money but on the other hand um, I feel sometimes this old world is really, really um, uh, wrong in many ways, right? So the, this kind of um, investment hypothesis of the, last, of the last 10 or 20 years to invest in these big centralized companies that create data monopolies. Cool. And, and so in, in, the block, in the blockchain space... <laughs> So in the blockchain space, it seems, right, in the, last, in the last two years at least, there's been so much money, right? And everybody doing an ICO, they're raising lots of money, and even, even people raising in venture rounds, raising lots of money at you know, early stages. So it seems like maybe capital isn't so scarce anymore. Doesn't that completely undermine the, the VC business model? Yeah, I think it, it does, I mean, it does create competition to some extent um, in that, you know, there are projects that we might have been, have wanted to invest in that just didn't raise VC money. So absolutely. Um, I think, so first, I think two things. So one is, I think the market is, it's getting more um, realistic and kind of um, reasonable again. So uh, these, you know, um, times where companies have raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars um, without anything really, except a white paper, um, are uh, seem to be over to a certain extent. So, um, and I think this is also um, a, a situation where it's more reasonable again for, or more likely for VCs again to come in. Um, and possibly invest either you know through through equity, but also of course through tokens. And the other thing is that I think many companies also do realize that um, capital is not everything. Um, I think this is a pretty well uh, understood argument actually that um, you know obviously VCs or investors in general can provide two things: they can provide capital, which you can get much easier today through a token sale from the crowd, but it's also um, experience in um, working with startups and, and scaling tech companies. And basically any decentralized project is also to a large extent just a tech company that um, is building a product and that is growing. And um, this is something that you know we um, and many other VCs of course have a lot of experience in. And then there's the component on top of it, which is the decentralized um, parts of the business model, which of course um, we have to learn as everyone else um, and newly. Yeah. But if you think like even further ahead, you know, not, not like at the moment in the next few years, like do you think it's possible that there will be a world where capital is just completely abundant and it is not scarce anymore at all? And like, what happens then? Yeah, we had a discussion earlier about this, yeah, and I, I think um, 
So I, I don't think so um, because, or my argument would be, at least raising capital is not going. That capital is not going to be for free because capital, by definition, is has value, and people are going to try to um, get more out or get something for it. So they're not just giving going to give it away for free. And um, even if there are many more people that are willing, or the the pool of capital that you can that you can, or the 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 pool of people that you can raise from it's much bigger, um, I think the market will regulate itself in the way that if people invest in bad projects, they are going to lose money and this is going to stop to some extent. So I don't think that it's going to continue that you can just raise, bad projects can, can continue to raise money. Um, what Elie said uh, earlier today, which I thought was really interesting, is kind of the aspect of um, a, a, an economy worldwide or a state where economic growth is not... Um, the most important factor anymore or not even existent anymore, <coughs> which would then, you know, certainly have a, a different, um, um, yeah, would have a different kind of um, drive or, or create a different kind of um, uh, yeah, driving forces, I guess, in the, in the entire economy, which I really, I mean, I've, I've heard this kind of line of thought before, but I really feel like I, I, I'm not sure what that would imply for, for the investment business. Yeah, can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, what, what we were talking during lunch actually is based on Albert, uh, Albert from USV that wrote this book, World After Capital, right? So what he's arguing about is that actually we've already living in a post-scarce world, right? And of course, this is very hard to, to, to measure right now. But the, the idea behind the concept is that if you think about our, like, you know, the hierarchy of our needs, uh, potentially there's enough capital and enough resources to be able to satisfy that globally. The problem is distribution, right? So the problem is how do we distribute that across the world because right now this is not, uh, it's captured by a few and it's not captured by, by the rest, right? So I, 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 can, I can envision a world that works like that. It's, 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 it's very hard to think about you know, what happens there though. But I, I actually, I am a bit on Albert's side. I think that we are approaching that state and distribution is the key, uh, the, the, the key problem. And I'm actually excited to see how this whole blockchain world reshuffles and redistributes in a different way if we accomplish that, right? Potentially we might not accomplish that and we have again the same greedy entrepreneurs that just capture everything for themselves and then we're back to centralized stuff. Uh, yeah, if anyone wants to add on that, I don't know. Well, well, I mean, so right. So you guys designing this protocol now. So you will have yeah. choices around how the economics yep. work, who gets how many tokens, etc. So how does that work? Yeah, how, how are you yeah. gonna make I, those decisions? Right. Uh, I think the way the way that I prefer to think about all of these new networks is that all of us are designing economies. Right. At the core of the protocol, there's a monetary policy that distributes that value some type of work and incentivize certain behaviors. I actually, yeah, I prefer to think about it like that because actually that's that's what's that's what's really happening in t take a network like we were discussing uh, like during last live beer for example, same story right? Like what we're doing with OSCO and we try to incentivize open source maintainers, basically distribute ownership and value back to back to open source projects. So what I think that is very interesting with that is that. You know, all of us now, we need to start thinking about these questions. While previously the model on Web 2.0 was, okay, you're building a product, value capture, value creation, value capture, right? Now it's not just about that, right? Now you need to think, this is a network versus a corporation in a way. So you need to think about holistically how this, how this economy operates and why this economy will actually be sustainable, right? So what we're doing with, with, with OSCO and it's very specific is targeting op the massive problem of open source sustainability for the people in the room that are uh, least technical, you know, we have one of the big holes of the internet where almost every digital organization from schools, hospitals, uh, 4,500 companies depend in an open source code base somewhere down the stack, but down there, if you look there, you have usually one person maintaining late at night, sweating this infrastructure while all of these different players, you know, uh, make money of that. So we try to rethink how that paradigm works and we try to, to basically take a real problem and make it better. Actually, I prefer I prefer the people that start with that. They start with real small local pro problems and then design economies around that. So that's, that's what we're going after. Um, yeah. So if this is a protocol, right? Yep. And then if the end you have this token that gets distributed and let's say there is some percentage that then gets 
So and let's you... say it succeeds in a large scale, and then you know, let's say there's some VCs that invest in those, some people that invest right. in their own, like a percentage of that protocol. Correct. I mean, the the example of HTTP is often made, right? Like, mm. okay, what if HTTP could have been monetized? Right. Uh, and what if someone owned five percent of like all oh. HTTP? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah, that, that, that sounds like a nightmare, uh, <laughs> like the way you described it. Uh, but I, I can give you like like a practical example. So, so what a lot of projects are actually doing right now is that they're raising capital because they want they want one thing. One like on the one side they want money to actually be able to bootstrap that network, take the Ethereum for example use case, right? Uh, but on the other side they want actually the signaling that private investors do, right? Like this network is valued. X. And then what they do is uh, we start seeing a lot of this idea of inflation funding being played out on the space. What's the idea is that you know the protocol mints new tokens and then distributes them based on a rule set. And what's very interesting there that a lot of people don't understand is that what the way that you write your rules, what what happens is that actually you're devaluing everyone else, and usually you're devaluing the capital that you know originally bootstrap the the network. In order, it's almost like inflation, but you redistribute that inflation to the people that contribute to the long-term sustainability of the economy, right? So I'm actually okay, like we've done the same thing with the project. I'm actually okay if there are two things. The one is if you're principled, okay? If you have very clear principles about, for example, in our case, we're saying that the open source community from day one needs to own the majority, like needs to own the majority of the network, right? 51% needs to be owned by the open source community. Not us, not investors. When we spoke with investors, we told them that this is the case. And then the second one is, you know, if you're honest with them, you tell them, do you want to play on that? Yes or no? You know, are you okay with that, right? So what I like about the space is that we start having this more principled-oriented uh, conversations because it's about an economy, right? In the end, if the economy is incentivizing the wrong players, the whole network won't survive. So that's one thing, be, be thoughtful about. The second one is be transparent as well. That's the beauty of a blockchain. In a way, this is codified, right? Anyone can see what are the things that you value and what are the things that you don't value. Uh, so yeah, that, did I answer your question? I went a bit off. Okay, 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 uh, cool. Uh. Uh, Florian, what are your thoughts? No. <laughs> On what? <laughs> what do you want to know? Uh, I think the aspect of you know, distribution and how one should think about that. Well, I mean, we're in the middle of a period where we're suddenly making the distribution of a coin within a network the decisive power in that network, actually, because we're switching from proof of work to proof of stake, or actually many network, many new networks springing up actually use it from the get-go, a proof of stake-based system, which really means that your influence in the network uh, depends on how how much of a fraction of that network you effectively own. So it kind of um, is a is a form of governance that uh, rewards rich people versus poor people in a sense, right? If you want to kind of put it to the top, it's more nuanced, but I think it's problematic. And um, the question to me is whether we are really building a future that is truly decentralized, or whether we are blindly running into a new sort of trap that then we will need the web 4.0 revolution for it to kind of, you know, let's re-decentralize re the web, right? And um, uh, recently there was a very interesting blog post by some researchers that looked at um, certain pro uh, delegated proof of stake networks, DPoS networks, and just looked at who are the people validating the blocks in that network. And what it turns out is that basically the employees of the companies building those networks are validating the blocks in that network. So what, what's actually happening is we're running a big fake smoke screen and what's really happening is there's companies running centralized systems claiming they're decentralized to get all the benefits from you know not being regulated by um, the financial market authority and the rules applying to it because it's decentralized, because there's no issuer and all that stuff is all based on the assumption that those are decentralized networks. But if, every, if, if all the people in the network are identical in person, it kind of stops being decentralized. So <laughs> to be very provocative, I really, I really question sometimes like what is it actually that we're building? So 
That brings me to another conversation that I had with a friend who's here in the room. Actually, he's a UX designer, and we've been um, discussing the value of user experience design in blockchain. Because how do you really empower the people in a blockchain system to start using their the fraction of what they own to stake it in the system and to vote, to vote on blocks or to participate somehow in the governance of the system? How do you do it? And today, really, you, ne you need to be able to you know, write command line stuff. You need to be able to understand code and read documentations on GitHub and all that stuff, right? So if we solve that user experience issue and make every person that doesn't even know what a blockchain is capable of participating in really important decisions being taken in that network, then maybe we are getting closer towards that dream of decentralization. Um. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, you go, you go. Uh, I can, I can say one more thing. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, no, maybe keep going. Actually, keep going. We can, yeah, we can, we can, we can keep going. Like, I can, I can bring up. The, the one thing that I wanted to add that 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 goes. Like I think it's close to what Florian was saying and what Travi was saying uh, before is that I think one of the exciting things right now is that there's no poster child, okay? And what I mean by that is that, you know, like for the ones of you that have been working, developing for companies during the web 2.0 days, etc., you know, you would always look at like, okay, what Google is doing, what Facebook is doing, this is the way that I need to do stuff. You know, it's, it's what Ravi was saying before. One of the positives of the space is that, you know, you have this, very like you know a group of many many smart people that Liz mentioned that actually now they're going after big problems and there's no poster child that to tell you that like this is how you should do this you know like we actually running this big scale experiment with monetary policy in a way in each of these networks and we're figuring things out as we go that doesn't mean that you know especially the good people just like don't look at the past we look at the past and try to learn as much as we can but the good story here is that you really have to rethink you know it's a new paradigm we spend time on rethinking existing problems different tools what could we do differently and I think that gives me hope on the one side on the other side of course there's so much hype and so much you know so many scammy teams right now in the space that make you feel like okay what do I have in common with all of these people you know like it's you know it, it's weird but but I think these are the, the pros and the cons and both of you want to talk about okay. yeah. no as, first of all I was just gonna say actually if for those of you who were at consensus <laughs> what you get when you put a lot of money and apparently smart people into a room then you get a crazy boat party where they give away free cars right so <laughs> it's just totally insane I mean it was just the like the kind of um, things that the that I mean I, I was just um, I'm just still amazed by this how some of the companies there were kind of just throwing away money by I mean, throwing away but like uh, spending money like crazy um, on these kind of things but actually what I wanted to say is that um, I think and I think you're exactly right um, in in the way that we have to figure everything out and what excites me about this so much is that especially around um, kind of token design and designing how to incentivize the different um, the different ecosystems and I think yours is a really interesting example um, because there are just kind of clear roles and ver and uh, you know several different roles um, that um, in in this in this ecosystem that have to be incentivized and kind of coordinated I think another interesting is, example is app coins which is um, kind of similar to you in the way that you have people who develop apps you have people who have to test them and so on. And all these kind of frameworks or the, the, the things that are being used to build these incentive mechanisms come from so many different fields that are, here, that are combined here, right? You have game theory, you have economics, and economic policy, and all those kind of different fields um, that have to be um, minted into code. And I think this is what really excites me um, about this a lot. Um, and I wish I could kind of spend most of my time and kind of thinking about how to build these incentive mechanisms. Um, yeah, I think this is really fascinating. Um, I, I want to enrich this discussion with an anecdote where uh, last November I had the pleasure to actually visit the country of Brazil for the first time in my life. And uh, 
because I was invited to speak at a conference at the, con uh, at the country's capital called Brasilia. And the funny thing about Brasilia is, is that it's a completely artificial city in the sense that it has been designed by a single person and then actually been built subsequently. And it's like a guy like Vitalik Buderin sitting, a genius in his field, <laughs> sitting at his desk and designing the perfectly incentivized economic system, governance, futurism, everything together, prediction markets, you know, just the perfect system to rule the perfect society. And um, this Oscar Niemeyer, the guy who designed the city, he was really a genius and he, there is a meaning behind every building in the city. It's super sophisticated, uh, very metaphoric. But when you go to the city, you, you, in less than 60 minutes, you're severely depressed because the city is dead. There's not a single person doing anything interesting anywhere in the street. Actually, the streets don't even have names. The streets have numbers because it's more efficient. And um, it's also that all the hotels are in one block. It's the hotel block. And all the restaurants are in another block. It's the restaurant block. And all the residential, <laughs> it's crazy. So, and when I drove through the city, I had this idea that this is the world we're currently designing with the protocols that we currently have. It's like, you know, people that are genius in one thing, like computer science and economics, and that have read all the, you know, all the crazy guys who got Nobel Prizes, and they are designing supposedly a world where all the people, you know, of the world should be happy in and unfold themselves in. It's quite unrealistic. So, as you rightfully said, it is a highly interdisciplinary endeavor to build a functioning economic social protocol, right? And I don't think we actually even have a clue of what it really implies because we don't, haven't seen yet any such protocol really deployed at scale, true scale. And probably a lot of stuff is lacking. And every lawyer would tell you, yeah, arbitration, governance, you know, all that stuff. But let's keep that aside. Probably even the mere economic policy of the coins, the monetary policy is probably also shit. I mean, even the guy Varoufakis, right, who is, I mean, he's kind of a hero. He, he even says that, you know, you can't just run a, com a, a country on a monetary policy that is 100% deterministic and algorithmic, right? Even that guy. And I'm not the, I'm not the person to judge this, but... It gives. It makes me think. So, um, uh, I I don't think we're really at the stage yet where we know what we're really doing. Uh, but I think we're on to something. That's yeah. Can I, you know. I <laughs> just to, to, to challenge you a little bit on one point. Like I'm actually, we are on the same page. I actually don't think that you know we haven't seen any of the systems at scale. So I don't think that anyone that pretends to say that like, hey, this is what we're after. Like, that's exactly what I meant with the poster child. There's no poster child. No one has done successfully, right? I, I, what I was arguing about is much more, I think the key feature here is this, you know, the ability for massive experimentation. You know, like each of these things are economies that now we can fork and modify and change, like to, to an extent that previously we weren't able to do that. You know, like we weren't able to have this massive scale experiment. So that's the one thing that gives me confidence, not the fact that we know what we're doing. It's much more that actually it's almost like an evolutionary process that hopefully will lead us to some of these economies that indeed would be stronger to some of these, you know, ex experiences and economies that we have today, basically. Okay. Did you have a question you want to move to? No, go, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I was thinking about the, the evolution and, and how we're doing this grand scale experiment. And it makes me think of that game Telephone. I don't know if this is a cultural reference that doesn't pass over to Europe, but there's this game where um, a, group of, a group of children will sit together and one ch the first child comes up with some sort of saying and then they say it to the next child and they, and they pass it through all the people and that by the time it gets back to them, everybody giggles because it's a completely different sentence than what was originally started. And that makes me think about how the evolution in the space, that there's this original intention that was set out and that each of us probably have our original intentions of why we're participating in the space, but we should all be very conscious of how we're passing that to the, to the wider circle of people as, as this grows, as this starts to make its way to 
the actual users, the the real people who will participate in this in this new world that we're we're building. That are we making sure our message, our our intentions are being seen through, and um, it goes through both the communication, how we represent ourselves, and how things evolve organically um, because we can't architect them perfectly now. But yeah, it's exciting, but it's also something that's you know very. We have to all be cognizant of that. There's pressure on us in that way too. Yeah, I mean, w one thing that was coming to mind before when, when you were giving your Brasilia example is that, you know, in a way what people are trying to design is these systems that then will come to life, right? And, and they will be decentralized and there will be these different parties orchestrating that. And even if you look at things like, you know, something like Ethereum, like how decentralized is Ethereum? Well, you know, there is certainly a small group of people right, that have like enormous weight in dis making decisions on code changes. There's maybe two clients that, you know, GAF and Parity or something like that, that actually have significant usage among miners. Right? So there's actually still a ton of centralization, even with something like Ethereum. Now, Bitcoin maybe is a bit better than Ethereum, but then many of the new projects, you know, they may have a foundation with hundreds of millions or, or, or tens of millions in assets and then there's one development team and one client and and, and it's it's hard to see how you're going to go from there to a system that is actually doesn't turn out into some sort of, you know, Brazilian, some sort of dead city where there was the assumption people will spring up and will come to life and it never actually ends up happening. And it's actually also kind of anti-capitalistic, right? Because uh, that's in, in some sense what planning economies in Soviet systems tried to do, right? They tried to plan the economy and we all know it's absurd. Economies are efficient by, you know, organizing decentralized information efficiently. And um, maybe we run into the same trap, right? Building decentralized protocols but in a centralized way might actually lead, might not absolve you from the problem. Maybe. And I mean, this is what some highly anticipated projects promise, like Tezos, like saying, well, we built the governance then directly into the protocol. Every block, you could completely change the, 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 the constitution of this network potentially, right? So maybe that needs to be thought into the protocol much more deeply. I don't know what it is. I really like this evolution idea. I, I think it's the, the, the missing piece to make sense of it, for sure. Yeah, yeah I agree. Maybe as a kind of, Adding on to that, I think the I, I fully agree with what you said earlier that we there's a lot of stuff or this is very all very promising, but no one has figured it out yet. And I think the key is to design these systems in a way that they are flexible enough to kind of learn or that the developers or whoever evolves those systems are able to effectively implement all the new learnings that we um gather along the way and I think this is so basically it's kind of a not designing the perfect governance or, or incentive mechanism but rather designing the governance in a way that it is actually possible to implement changes in, a, in an effective way. I think this is kind of the main, for, to me this is the main foundation I guess for a, or one of the very important foundations of a project going, going forward. Yeah, and just to add, coming back to open source software and usability, um, that that industry has learned that there needs to be a feedback loop. That you need to you need to be adaptable. You need to actually reach out to the users and find out how they're using it, what changes they want, and then feed that back in. And I think that those kinds of lessons are things that we need to not forget. Yeah, if I can add one thing that worries me on the exact same conversation is. Like we talked before about capital and like how much money exists on the space right now. Like one of the biggest fears that I have is that this is, especially the institutional capital that's coming in, it like has very specific expectations about what needs to happen here very quickly. And that's why you see this conversation about like, you know, hey, we need dApps that work with, you know, hundreds of millions of people today. And then, you know, like, you ask yourself, like, hey, have you tried to develop on this infrastructure? You know, it's like, it's actually still very early on. It's very ugly, right? So I hope that, I, I hope that somehow, you know, all of this inflow of capital doesn't lead to this, you know, basically imbalanced expectations, like in, 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 in a way 
and I hope that you know we give a bit more space, a, a bit more space to, to 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 the infrastructure because we're learning. Like like you know, think about token engineering. What the, what Trend does here in Berlin, it's it's fantastic, right? Like you know, we try to learn how to design the systems, and we're not ready yet to actually go and have like these apps with billions of people. Like you know, you shouldn't be comparing like you know right now the decentralized web with you know the experience that you have on Google because the infrastructure isn't there. You know, so I hope that. People in the room understand that, and I hope that, especially the VCs in the room, understand that, and you know, <laughs> and 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 play accordingly. Yeah, no, I mean, I fully agree. I mean, um, and this is also something that I think um, I hope VCs or investors in general can. I mean, I, I, I mean, Trent, uh, maybe to just to, to add on this. I mean, Trent is Trent, co-founder of Pickchain DB and Ocean Protocol. Um, is basically uh, has started this whole kind of um, I want to say community or you know just kind of movement in general around token engineering and has basically also said you know that engineering um, the the incentive mechanisms and so on and governance mechanisms is really important and um, I think that for us because at least uh, I think one of the questions also in the in the event description was kind of how can VCs add value <clears throat> in the future. Um, I think it could be around this because <clears throat> we see um, several projects or if we invest in projects, we work together with several projects that all have this challenge and um, at least <clears throat> so the value that we add or that investors can add in general comes from having the comparison of multiple projects and you know if we make these, these experiences of token engineering and so on across multiple pro projects, and this could be something that investors or kind of more um, general participants of the ecosystem that don't just work on one project would be able to contribute because you just make multiple um, experiences in that in that field. Or you can transfer knowledge across projects. So originally, right in in the in the crypto space. There was a lot of sort of anarchist thinking, right? And and today maybe it's become more mixed. But the question, of course, is still like you know what 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 does regulation and and existing nation states and and democracy like how do those interact? So what what is your thought on that, Florian? Do you think there may be just a transitionary period where? like they have power to, to change the course of this? Or do you think this is, like there's gonna be some sort of ongoing interplay between those? The, the nation states, you mean? Yeah, between yeah. kind of existing governments. normal yeah. governments, their, regu their regulatory entities, you know, the yeah. lawmaking power, mm. and this kind of you know, new decentralized world. Well, you know, I think blockchain has this ability to reveal the true nature of things. And part of this ability means that, for example, at least my experience, my personal journey was, I never even questioned what money was. That just didn't come to me for some reason. But as soon as I stumbled upon Bitcoin and then blockchain and started to read about all of it, suddenly thinking about the nature of money was a natural thought to me because um, it, it shifted my perspective on everyday reality in a sense. And I feel that blockchain technology and its wider application will have a similar effect on the concept of what a nation state is and what community means, what identity is, um, um, and all those very fundamental questions, we don't even think about them because we're born into a functioning system that serves us some answer to those questions and nobody teaches us to even ask the question. And blockchain is this completely new narrative that as soon as a mind has absorbed it, just makes you question a lot of fundamental things. And I think a lot of the constitutional concepts of a nation state are being called into question by this technology. So I think inevitably, yes, we will see, you know, the true nature of what <laughs> the wider community we live in, which here is Germany, right? It's, it's I mean, maybe it's our, our, our flatmates, then it's our maybe f wider family, it's our, our district, we live in the city, and then maybe, you know, at some point it's Germany, the country, it's part of the community that we're part of here. And um, it will reveal its true nature, what it really means, right? 
do we still need Germany as a concept in the future? Do we need an organizational unit of that size? Is it maybe, you know, not big enough to really serve us and not small enough to really serve us? Do we maybe need, you know, a, a government of Berlin and a government of the world, right? Maybe, do we even need something in between? I have no idea, but I think those, you know, things that we took for granted around the concept of a nation state will slow, slowly dissolve as uh, the, the, the digital reality kind of takes over our perception of the world in general. Um, I guess that's a general thing happening. Yeah, yeah I, I can add that. I think, I think Florian spot on with this idea of questioning. Indeed, you know, right now a lot of people on the space are questioning stuff. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean just like disregarding again to your early early point that even for even even for 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 people that actually like you know don't believe in state at all, like you know, still there are many people, especially like take German for example. There are a lot of people that believe in that institution in a way, right? So you need to observe about what's happening. But I think it's very healthy that like a lot of smart people start questioning stuff and I, like I think you go you went much further than that I'm, I'm more I'm much more excited with fundamental things which like hey how can we upgrade fundamental processes that we use today like take voting for example like does that work you know like like could we do this better for example right like take fundamental processes that we've been using on a day-to-day -day basis start evolving them with this nice new piece of technology that we have right now and then and then, of course, you know, like I think, I think, I think you're also right on on the bigger play. I think, you know, science is evolving so fast. Like, you know, science like a mountain that is, you know, getting taller and taller every day. I think it's 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 a very re relevant question to ask. Like, could we have, you know, like a few individuals like governing basically such like such a mass population? Could that work? I don't know, but I think. I'm much more excited by things like democracy Earth, for example, what Santiago is doing, etc. Like, let's let's try to upgrade our processes and where that would lead to be seen. I don't think that anyone anyone knows the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think one interesting question when you talk about this kind of future is so you know before you also talked about coin coin voting and kind of coin governance, right? So this is of course one thing that you know potentially puts a lot of power into you know kind of early creators and investors in those networks and i think the other thing that we have is just the complexity and and, and this all being technology driven and the complexity is so high for a lot of this blockchain stuff and at least my impression is it's just getting more and more and more complicated at an ever increasing rate so it seems to me that you know if if we will reinvent all of those concepts it's not going to be a process that will have mass participation, right? It will be driven by a very small group of people. Do you think, do you agree with that? Or do you see that differently? No, I, I do agree that it is a, an elite, again, an elite uh, creating those initial rules. And um, uh, it's not for no reason that I think there is a lot of call to, you know, ethical software development, ethical development of algorithms. I mean, we're here in our blockchain bubble. Over there is the artificial intelligence bubble, and they think they are way more important than us, and they actually might be right. So there's which is one bubble among multiple that think they would change everything, and somebody probably will at some point. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I don't have a solution for this fundamental problem, uh, except maybe uh, making people aware if they aren't already that we shouldn't, you know, fool ourselves into thinking that just because there's the blockchain tag on it, it brings anything new or different. Um, so far, the blockchain hasn't really disrupted any real system except maybe the, the venture capital system actually <laughs> I, I don't know of another one that has been disrupted really <laughs> i would argue story of value as well like you know like i'm not a bitcoin maximalist but i would argue story of value like you know the story that i always say is that i'm originally from greece i heard about bitcoin 2011 in greece not in germany you know and there was a reason for that you know like you know there are states indeed today that you know people have lost their faith in governments and having the ability to use bitcoin is a killer app so you know it's 
being able to actually store your value somewhere and trust that even if that thing fluctuates, it's much, it's much better than the constant, you know, devalued of your money. Call it Venezuela, call it like, you know, I don't know, like China, call it Greece, call it Cyprus. So don't don't forget that one, please, because it's important, I think, for, for a lot of people. Yeah. I was just going to add that I think revolutions require discontent. <laughs> like you were saying, like you need to be discontent in some form to, to seek out a better solution. And I think that if we are going to have any kind of revolutions, we need people on board. To get people on board, this needs to be something that they can see value and connect with. They need to find some sort of user usability, use case for it, um, and have a good user experience that is better than what they're discontent with. And so if we really do want to change things, we have to look at it from that perspective. And also, if you look through history, every time there is any kind of like major change within how humans operate, the Industrial Revolution, the Information Revolution, you look at those, it doesn't disrupt every aspect of people's lives. It only disrupts a selection of their lives, too. So I think it is a bit foolish in our bubble for us to think that we're going to change everything in the world. Um, but we do have an opportunity to change some stuff, and yeah, you got to get the people on board. Cool. I, I would say let's also open for questions. If anybody has any questions, do you, uh, Ola, do you mind? So um, the past little bit, we've seen Facebook and Google really coming under fire for some of their practices, which I think everyone in this room has probably been waiting for for a while. Uh, but to the rest of the world, it's kind of a new thing. Um, we've heard about Brasilia already today in kind of a dystopic future. So rather than talking about the ways we can make the world better, how can, let's really conspire. How can we make the world worse? What are the things that we're going to do that will be really bad and in 10 years time, everyone will be saying, why didn't we come after those blockchain people sooner? <laughs> I can freestyle it, but uh, like one, one idea that comes to, our, to my head is, uh, I was actually discussing it with a friend before, uh, is, is this idea that look at what's happening right now in the world, right? Like you have like uh, initial country offerings, you know, like, like Venezuela basically issuing their own cryptocurrency, which is obviously not decentralized, right? Like, you know, so you get all of the, all of the bads of the cryptocurrency that everything is tracked, everything somehow is transparent, and now you're putting it into that context, and that's like a clear dystopian future that I don't want to think about. I mean, another one that potentially you might be coming is the same idea, but from corporations, right? Like apparently Facebook is working on blockchain stuff. I don't know what that might be, but you know, like you, you basically again, you see, you take that, you take some of the features of that thing, you remove the, the key underlying technology, and now this thing is basically a nightmare. So that is one way that this thing can actually go very wrong, and then, you know, you should have been like, hey, why the fuck we didn't, like, you know, stop these people early on? Uh, so yeah, that's one. <laughs> I don't know. Add more. Uh, I think this is also often quoted example of the Chinese citizen scorecard. That is basically this idea that every Chinese citizen has a score of its social value. And um, if you think about the blockchain with this immutable identity system, then yeah, that's obviously an awful idea to, to, to remove every facet of privacy or uh, anything from a person's life. I guess that's truly what we could ruin. I, I guess there are more ideas. Uh, so there's this television show called Black Mirror. <laughs> I think we need to do a few episodes of that, but yeah, that you made me think of that with yeah. the the writing episode. But we could do more, yeah. And and maybe actually convincing. I mean, that's also something I find interesting, right? So and I actually read it here again on this manifesto of this space. It's like the first time in history that the young are teaching the old, and it's kind of true. Um, and, you know, we could just convince actually everybody that we should now, you know, put the euro on the public Ethereum chain and then the next day there's just a 51% attack of somebody, right? I mean, it's probably possible, I don't know. Actually, I thought about that and I, I, I wanted to add that use case. If you, if you really think what happened like since basically last like June with the spike in prices, you know, we actually convinced a lot of mainstream users to join the space somehow, right? And then we screw them over, <laughs> kinda, right? Like the market's basically, the market's just, you know, like 
took the money of the average Joe, right? And 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 where I'm going with that is that, you know, I don't think that we were ready for that. If you really think about what the space did, it enabled us to transact directly around money and financial instruments in a way. But you know, I don't think that the world has been ready yet for that at scale. So there's apparently like you know there's a lot of manipulation in the market right now and the counter argument to that is that take the existing markets is there manipulation yes or no i don't know but one of my fears is that indeed like you know we generated so much excitement about this thing we're not delivering a lot of value and then also we just screw over all of this you know just you know average investors that just came in because they thought that this is exciting and i don't know where that would lead i have no idea but potentially that might lead something bad oh. <laughs> cool i also have some ideas uh, so I mean, I, I think one, one of the interesting things about about cryptocurrencies is that you can't really seize it so easily, right? So the government can't really just take it away from you. Of course, that is great in many ways, but one of the implications may also be that you can't really collect taxes well anymore. So I, I could totally see that maybe we have this huge crypto economy, a massive amount of the economy and wealth creation shifts into that. The people, you know, a small, small number of people kind of control that. They manage to avoid taxation to a huge extent. And then you have the, the kind of traditional democracies, nation state, like, you know, going bankrupt, unable to meet their, uh, you know, social, you know, pensions, all of those uh, obligations. And then you just have this, you know, world left where many people don't understand what's going on, feel like they have absolutely no say in what's happening. And, and sort of these familiar structures like falling apart. I, I, I totally see that happening. Well, it, I'm sh you know, I'm sure it has many good sides, but also I'm sure it would be seen by many people as, as you know, a very bad outcome. Yeah, maybe. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's. Uh, I mean, it's decentralization is not one or zero, right? It's it's a it's a kind of spectrum of how you build governance of these things, uh, of these of these networks. And I think it's just going to again. I think um, things are going to be figured out on the way, and we are going to hopefully find solutions on how to govern um, decentralized networks in a way that are responsible but at the same time decentralized. And um, I think that, so one concept here that I, I think is very interesting that is not new is liquid democracy. I mean, this this has existed before and there's actually, um, and it, it, it is an interesting combination with crypto because, so liquid democracy is basically being able to transfer, so it's a democracy where it's one person, one vote, but it's possible to transfer votes um, to other people. And um, blockchain obviously, is a good, um, is a helpful technology to enable this because it allows to transfer votes um, securely. Um, and there are projects that are, that, are, um, that are trying to build this. So, and I think liquid democracy where people who actually know, like bluntly said, know what they're doing, have more power, um, is a great way of, or is a, an, an interesting tool um, to, uh, to use for governance of any um, either state or decentralized economy or something like that. I think another thing that just comes to my mind is how like in the early 90s when you were checking out the internet and there were startups doing IPOs, like everything the same kind of like now but selling stocks. Um, the problem that they had was among, I mean, many scalability issues, whatever, is that user behavior was not really trained to understand what the internet is, right? What are the possibilities? And just even the trivial thing of putting your credit card information into web browser in 1995, I don't know how many people would have even trusted the web browser or whatever with their credit card details. And today I feel like I enter my credit card details once a day into some form online. And 
it's kind of like that with the blockchain. How do you um, teach people to you know, capture all the options that they now suddenly have with this new infrastructure? I mean, it starts with installing currently an, ident an identity management solution in your web browser like MetaMask, right? I mean, even being aware of that and then um, starting to use your voting possibilities in a network and so on. So this is a lot about teaching people with, you know, U UI, UX design and with, I don't know, really basic narratives about their new digital freedoms and stuff about what they can do. And until we haven't done all that, basically spent all those ICO millions on education campaigns for the users, we we'll probably won't see the world governing themselves with this technology. But I think it's actually an option if we would do that maybe. Hello, uh, so I'm Fahim. And I had two questions, uh, one on the technology side. So my question is, uh, as you know that the crypto market has been really unstable in the past few months, and it is still very unstable. So how important is the stability of the crypto market for the development of the blockchain technology in general? And my second question is on the legal aspect. Uh, I'm from India. So as you already know that India has become hostile towards cryptocurrencies. So uh, doesn't it go against the idea of decentralization that a third party is able to control your access to it? Those are my two questions. Yeah, the first one was uh, that the crypto market is very unstable right now. Yeah, okay. How important is the stability of the crypto market for the development of the blockchain technology in general? Yeah, so, so I, I think Chris Dixon is talking about that, and he he was arguing in one of his recent blog posts that you know the space is evolving primarily because this technology has win the hearts. Of, of developers, right? So indeed, there are a lot of people that have been excited about this for some time. It's not that, you know, the fact that like last year we saw the spike suddenly, like, you know, of course that has impact, right? But I don't think that these two things are like like coupled tightly in a way. So I, and, and I mean, the funny thing that's happening also, and maybe Ravi can talk about this, is that this year that the public market appears to be very unstable or not performing that well, the private markets are going crazy, actually, right? So, so you, you have like, it's, it's a very complex world, I think, to be able to, 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 to connect them. But I would say at the core for every foundational like technology and every, every new paradigm shift, the core is like, can you win the heart of the crazy ones, of the innovators, right? And I think crypto has succeeded on that. Now the question is what we gonna do with that, right? Like, can, 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 we, can we create something, something interesting from that? And of course, you know, the, the, the influx of money is both of a pro and a con as we discussed. Like, it comes with a lot of benefits and also a lot of drawbacks, so yeah, to be seen. So on your second question, maybe someone else wants to go for it. What was the second? Uh, <laughs> what was the second question again? Yeah. Uh, so my second question was that India has already become hostile towards cryptocurrencies, and it is slowly banning. It, it has already asked the banks to stop all transactions related to cryptocurrency purchases. So uh, my question was that doesn't it go against the idea of decentralization when a third party like the government controls your access to it? Yeah. So how do how do you <laughs> yeah. how do you ensure that uh, it does not happen? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there's, I think the answer is it depends on what that third party is that's blocking the, the action. If the third party is a government, that's a different equation than if it's a private company. Um, the, the levers that we have to pull to influence that will, will vary. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult because we are citizens of countries. And so there, and we're residents of countries. We need to be within a, a government's power this currently. Um, so I think that if it's government that's blocking it, then I guess you have to find some sort of way to influence your government um, or to have a voice in the government. Yeah, you could build technologies that work around the government too. And there's a reason there's the, the so-called Crypto Valley Conference in a few weeks as well. So. A lot of people went to Switzerland because their local government wouldn't help them do an ICO. So I guess the answer is it depends, and it depends on what you're, what links you're willing to take and what you want to support in terms of change in the world. But yeah, I mean, I think true decentralization would mean that you would not have another party blocking you. Hello, uh, Vincent speaking. 
Sorry, the lawyer on the right hand side. I'm curious, when you speak about Brasilia, you speak highly of it. When you speak about communist planning, you speak poorly of it. Brasilia is centrally planned. Do you know how much of the population in Brasilia are employed by the government? Oh, a high percentage for sure. Above 60%. Yeah. That is as central as you could possibly get. The only reason why Brasilia hums, if it does, is because everyone else in the country is paying for it. Okay, appreciate it, yeah. Necessary Just context. with regard to yeah, centralization yeah. reality. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Leo. Hi, um, Lorenzo. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for this really interesting discussion. Um, I think... Um, yeah, for me, like, it's, it's something that has been missing sorely from the conversations that I've had. Um, this topic about the fundamentals. So what are, we, what are we talking about? What are we trying to build? And I think we, maybe one, one little element that maybe is missing from this conversation is what we could maybe define as some historical perspective. Um, in the sense that uh, if we look back at where like, technologies like Bitcoin come from, um, and, and the emails that Satoshi wrote, for example, there is a very strong kind of uh, what we could define uh, as uh, U.S. libertarian, uh, right-wing libertarian, anarcho-capitalist streak to, to the people who were, to the cypherpunks who were like building the technologies that we all use today. And uh, I think that uh, it's very important to recognize that they encoded values that they believed in, in these technologies, and, and, uh, and that uh, we are either willingly or unwillingly creating the world that they wanted to create. And I think it's very important that this type, type of conversation is explicit. Um, when, it, when we talk about decentralization, for example, so what kind of decentralization, like when you say we could imagine a world where we only have cities and there is nothing at the state level, that's great, but are we talking about, talking about a form of decentralization that is like Peter Thiel-like, that is like Murray Rothbard-like, Rothbard or are we talking about Rojava, you know? And these two things are very different, and, um, and I think, yeah, I I'm, I'm really appreciate this, this event, and I think we can and should go deeper in this sense. Yeah, I think uh, when we were preparing for the panel, we did talk about the different levels of decentralization and, and how just everybody uses the word right now and they can mean a, a hundred different things. But I would also say, well, it's important for us to think critically about why um, well, that technology is not neutral, technology is not neutral, and that the, the cypherpunks who started out some of this, they had original intentions, but we should also question, are we really fulfilling those intentions? Do we want to be fulfilling those intentions? I would say it depends on the project, it depends on the, the company, the effort that's going on as to whether or not they are, and um, whether or not they want to be. And I think that that's, again, thinking back to that telephone game, that you know, as we try to like, talk to our neighbors, our, our friends, our family, about the stuff that we're interested in, how are we conveying that message, and how are we teaching them the, the critical thinking skills that were mentioned here, too, about these projects and, and what they're supporting? Um, I also think that, you know, the values that the cypherpunks imprinted onto the technology we're using now it kind of stops at a certain level and it stops kind of with cryptography because everything that was built on top of the cryptography, meaning the blockchain, this kind of decentralized syncing mechanism between thousands of computers, it's just one arbitrary solution to an intractable problem. And there have been many um, or different kind of uh, uh, Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithms for decentralized distributed databases even before the blockchain. So it's really arbitrary. And I don't think there's necessarily a cypherpunk, a residual cypherpunk value system sitting in there. It's just that they gave us the tools to actually build it, which is very cool. So a asymmetric cryptography and so on is very powerful and gives us that, but the way we want to keep the network running, the way we want to invent or keep issue this, the monetary policy we want for, like Bitcoin, the monetary policy of Bitcoin, it models the exploitation of gold mines somehow. That's so arbitrary, why not silver? 
why not? <laughs> you know, it's arbitrary. I don't think there's something necessarily cypherpunk about it. Except of cryptography, though. Like, I think, I think, I think that this. I, you said that. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. No. Okay. I, I, I just, yeah. I, I think that you know, using cryptography at the core of this is. I, it's probably the only thing that indeed you know is like, like it has that. But to to answer your your to answer your point, like you're right. Like you know, we codifying values and principles and these things. The good story is that we're doing this transparently, right? Like transparently if you're an engineer and you can go able actually and, and, in, and interpret that, that, that goes, what goes down there, right? So like my take on you is that you're gonna see everything that this world has now. Like you're gonna see all sorts of stuff in there. You know, you're gonna see attempts for universal basic income. I think there's a team in Berlin that does that, for example. And you're gonna see attempts to just, you know, like, like don't want to ditch DPoS or anything. Like you're gonna see, but you're gonna see at times like, hey, like we capture everything going out with like a decentralized brand, but in practice we own eight percent of the network, like you know, three individuals. So you're gonna see everything. I think the point is, and I know that you're an engineer. I think the point is that you know we've been shaping the future in that sense now. So I think that's the ability that Satoshi gave us to be able to experiment and go back to some of its fundamentals and codify some of these some of these principles and values and you know hopefully you know the right ones will evolve like i don't know what right ones means for you it might mean something different from me you know but that, that i think that's the main thing that that, that satoshi gave us yeah um thank you uh, my question is actually related to the last comment, which is uh, regarding the word decentralization, because decentralization means different things for different people, and I wonder if the word itself is misleading. We use the word in a way of like a, this common denominator to continue making these tools, right? Like, you cannot disagree with decentralization because it's too good. So we all kind of force in disagreement on this word without actually being specific about what, he, what we mean by that. So we're continually moving without having these conversations, without being specific about the world that we're intending to build. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think this is one of the many terms that are being misused or being misinterpreted by different people. Like we also, we, yeah, some of them, decentralization is one governance, which is a very hot topic on the space. Like it means 25 different things for 25 different people, right? So I agree with you, I, I mean, I th Thing we should put it in context, and I don't know if Brian, you want to do that to continue this conversation. We tried at the beginning. I don't know if you were here. Like the first question of Brian was like, "What does decentralization mean to you?" But you know that was still to me <laughs> in a way. So that might mean different things for different people here. I don't know. Do you want to use more? No. Okay. We we can have the conversation after on like what it, what it means for you and have a conversation on that basis. I think just generally to add it is like decentralization is the idea of moving responsibility away from some center that was thought to be necessary to the people that are actually concerned with the outcomes of the decisions that need to be taken, right? That, that's somehow the idea, the very principal idea behind it. It's just a stab at it, I'm not sure. I was just going to say it doesn't have to be people though. Oh, yeah. It's okay. the idea of, yeah, yeah, because it could be, because there, you know, people could accurately use the word that they decentralize it away from to other organizations. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, I think it's like the term security too, that, you know, you can say something secure, you can say something's decentralized, but you should all of, always follow it up with a question of like, how is it secured or how is it decentralized? On what level are you speaking about? Because you can surely make the claim on some level, but not maybe every. It's true, like even Uber and Airbnb are peer-to-peer -peer networks, right? Nobody cares that they run on centralized infrastructure. They are peer-to-peer -peer economies happening on a centralized infrastructure. I would challenge that. Yeah, I would challenge it too, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like acknowledged, an acknowledged fact almost, I would say. Yeah. You're a lawyer, it's debatable. There's a question the back. I have a great question to segue into this security and uh, decentralization bit that you're on. Uh, the cost of a 51% attack on either proof of work or proof of stake systems is not really that high. The infrastructure is not secure. Endpoints are riddled with security flaws even before specter attacks, etc. Are we building on sand from a, from a security perspective? Are we building on sand. Okay, on sand. Yeah. So, you want to go? Stay here? 
Oh, security is tough. Talk to anybody who works in the security industry and they'll tell you that nothing's 100% secure. So it's all about risk management. You gotta figure out tolerance level. You gotta figure out what your threat model, threat model is and of nothing's 100% secure. So, but that's not a reason to give up on security. It's just to make sure that we all understand that it depends on the circumstances and the threat models and everything. So yeah, if you're storing, I don't know, really, really, really sensitive data, 100 million, 100 billion dollars, or I'm sorry, Bitcoin. <laughs> we're, we're 100 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin on your heart, on your mobile phone. Then maybe you should think twice about that versus like if it's just you know some emails that you don't care if they become public. But anyway, it just depends. Yeah, and, and to demonstrate the point again, like I, I agree with Liz. There's no perfect security. Uh, like on the other side, though, okay, like if this argument's coming from another centralized world, like take all of the data hacks that have been happened as well, right? Like, you know, are these people are building on sand? Maybe sometimes, you know, like we have these massive data breaches that happened that, you know, really like put people's data in 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 in, in, in a difficult position. So I I, th I think the question's probably coming because of the timing. Like I think the last week there have been a lot of attacks actually uh, in, in different smaller coins. I think that's probably where it's coming from. Uh, I would argue that indeed today we have currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum that have proved over time that they are, you know, secure enough. <laughs> you know, they have like basically like they have survived from 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 significant attacks. On the other side, indeed, right now, yeah, we have like on the altcoins, we have coins that obviously are not secured enough. So again, it's not black or white. You know, there are a lot of attempts that are happening on the space to make sure that you know we 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 taking security uh, as as we treating security as as, as important as, as we should be treating it. Yeah. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. I mean, I, I was very worried about that with Bitcoin like years ago because it, it like sort of game theoretically the, the security of Bitcoin is not particularly good and the cost of attacking relative to the value secured is is, is fairly low, even, even though of course in absolute terms it's very high and, and it's kind of going down over time as, as the inflation decreases. So, and, and I think it is maybe also a concern that almost there's not enough attacks on decentralized networks. So you have a lot of these systems that may have weak security models, like delegated proof of stake is another thing that like has some questionable security models, but but because then nobody's attacking these networks, it, it almost doesn't get exposed. And so I do think that's actually a big risk in that, in that like people build insecure systems, nobody really attacks them and maybe at some point they're massive and then they get attacked and, and that then a lot of these things come down crumbling. But but I do think actually a proof of stake theoretically could be extremely secure, right? If you have uh, uh, security bonds and, and so I, I think one will be able to, to build really secure systems. And I think anybody judging uh, companies in that space needs to take into account that for the first time in history, really, that those companies are 100% transparent about what's happening. They have to be, actually, because the inner, the inner workings of their company, in a sense, are online and transparent to everybody. So, actually, you should probably run your project on that blockchain that has been attacked the most and not the least, absurdly. But yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I think we, we can wrap up here. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Do we still want to, is the keep key giveaway time for this? <laughs> All right, does anybody have the Satoshi is female bag with them? This is not a trustless system. <laughs> so there could have been a 50% attack. <laughs> but Ari here is going to announce the winner. Here, I'll hold the bag and you can pull out the names. All right, so we're going to see who our keep key winners are. And I apologize in advance if I butcher your name. Lorenzo. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Lorenzo, Lorenzo, Lorenzo. <laughs> and it's Lorenzo again. <laughs> All right, and for number two. Vincent James Riddle. All right. 
There you go, Vincent. Yeah. Okay, so thanks so much again for Shapeshift, Early Bird, the family, Ola, and everyone for helping organize this. And uh, thanks so much to all of you for coming.